Uh, yeah, what I'm hoping to do is basically kind of walk through a, um, this is the grant layout and this is what I've done in year one in the endpoint. That should take about 15, 20 minutes, maybe a little more. And then after that, have a discussion about what would be good things to launch into for year two. I have some suggestions uh, I can put up at the end and then um, I will take any others that people have so I can figure out how to keep pushing things forward with this community. Lake Champlain Sea Grant COVID-19 Aquaculture Industry Enhancement Project. And this is what I've done in year one, or we've done. The correct keyboard. There we go. All right, so just a reminder of the project mission, which is to uh, identify and reach out to aquaculture owners and operators in the in the basin. And I extended that, extended that out to all of Vermont to uh, identify their needs, develop and implement a tailored education program that enhances, the, addresses those needs and enhances production of marketable species. So in this project is premised on this idea that, there we go, on this idea that the US actually produces a very small portion of the um, aquaculture products that we consume, the seafood in general that we consume. So NOAA, particularly in the last administration, was interested in figuring out how to enhance that Sea, domestic seafood production, aquaculture was part of that um, recipe. So overall project objectives. Uh, the first was to develop state and regional advisory network to harden the industry to future disruptions. Second was to develop an aquaculture community of practice. Third is to develop some kind of understanding of the needs of aquaculture businesses in Vermont and the Lake Champlain Basin, and then expand aqua, that aquaculture community in the basin in Vermont. We want to enhance the ability of aquaculture businesses to respond to market disruptions and to become more resilient and provide an introductory workforce development opportunity. It's just a review of the operations in the state so, and I've added a couple to this since you saw it last. So we have our original seven producers. So five hatchery slash fish farms, one aquaponic operation, and then Sweet Sound Aquaculture, which is a shrimp operation. I've since learned about a place named Algae Power, which is kind of a startup in South Burlington. It looks like they've been around since about 2016, 17. And they're calling their operation polyponics. Basically, it's raising algae and other kind of primary producer organisms. So one of the things they tout is that having an algae system that can feed a copepod system, for example, and then using those products to make uh, um, high EDTA uh, ingredients, for example. Another one that came to my attention is called Caledonia Aqua Farms. They are really still in the planning stages. They are tied to the East Rygate Biomass Power Plant and the Born Global Corporation or Born Global Group. So the idea is to use the waste heat from that operation to raise something. And I was part of a, oops, hang on. So, and I was part of a uh, kind of a design sprint activity. We were both we were both in that involved in that. So I got to learn a little bit about their East Rygate operation. Like I said, they're very new. They've gotten not very far at all as far as a uh, um, setup, but they are planning to do something that's on a larger scale than any of the other producers in the state. So, and I've managed to, I got a bunch of site visits in this year, and, you know, these are some of the people that I've managed to scoot around the state and see. So, Holly up at um, Finn and Root, it's the aquaponics operation, Matt Danaher, which is, he's got the biggest operation in the state. He's also been around not quite the longest, but close. Um, John Brawley, who does the shrimp, 
in Charlotte. Uh, Shay, who is uh, up in Newport, and he is running um, trout through uh, on his cattle farm, which used to be a dairy farm and is also a maple sugar operation. And, um, and you have Curtis, who's out in Wheelock, and he is also one of the longest standing operators in the state who has a flow through operation for trout and brook trout, along with a, uh, a farm operation. So the rest of this, I'm gonna go through those project objectives one at a time and talk about how we have addressed some of the action items um, that are associated with them. So first off was um, developing state and regional advisory networks to harden the industry to future disruptions. So we did convene an aquaculture advisory committee. Thank you all. So the little check marks means I actually did it. And then the box means it's partly done or not done yet. Uh, so I did survey the advisory group to kind of get an idea of what your knowledge base, base and background was. And that was a questionnaire I distributed in 2021 at the beginning of the project. So we identified holding five um, meetings as kind of our baseline goal for the advisory group committee. And we've done the introductory kind of needs assessment results. Um, I had a recorded meeting with Vermont Fresh Network. Uh, we did the dairy occupancy uh, meeting, talked about regulations, also did in, and then there's this annual review. And then, you know, something on the docket is a fish health meeting, and we haven't gone beyond planning that yet. Um, trying to get meetings set up between the aquaculture advisory group and some of the aquaculturists. We've done a little bit of this and then do some targeted um, meetings between uh, AAC members and producers with specific questions. So that I haven't done much of yet. So as far as developing the aquaculture community practice, so one of the things we targeted was one-on-one -on -one phone interviews, specifically at the beginning of this project, just to get an idea of where everyone was and what their operations were. And then communicate with those um, businesses across the, the basin. So basically set up an email list and be able to distribute information. So there have been a lot of email chains that have gone out, phone calls that have been tried to do roughly quarterly and then site visits this past year as well. There's a action item there to guide neophyte aquaculturists through lessons and interactions. Um, so this, uh, I'll be working on this year, particularly advising um, NR289, the Advanced Ecological Design. So we're going to have some students in that class build an aquaponics system. And as we go through, you're going to see some overlap in some of the um, action items here. And then spending time engaging with uh, potential new producers. So I had uh, I visited Sarah on their um, dairy farm kind of lease co-lease project, and uh, I had some folks who contacted me about being interested in the industry and tried to point them in Sarah's direction to kind of get an idea of what the opportunities might be down the road as far as setting up their own operations. So not that it's necessarily going to happen soon, but it's just making those connections. I've conducted at least five site visits. Um, I'm trying to hit everybody. Uh, one of them, uh, Louis. <laughs> one of them, Louis, has been, uh, uh, he's basically decided he's retired, so I haven't really targeted him much, but there's a couple other folks I'm trying to track down. And we're working on facilitating the formation of a Vermont Aquaculture Association. And John Brawley, who is a collaborator on the grant, is uh, leading that effort. And he says that they're pretty much ready to file the nonprofit paperwork with the state. And then last is virtually convening a cohort of aquaculture professionals. We're hoping that will happen around the kickoff of the uh, Aquaculture Association sometime in late January, early February. If you guys have questions, just pipe in. I can't actually see anything <laughs> besides my presentation. So, okay. So, 
as far as understanding the needs of aquaculture businesses in Vermont and the basin. So we've implemented a needs assessment that was completed in spring 2021. So we did a report on the results of that needs assessment to the AEC in the first meeting. And then we've tried to, again, this is some of that overlap, match the uh, member expertise with some of those, some of the things that came out of the needs assessment. So one was that dairy conversion co-occupation. Um, I got someone on uh, from the Farm Bureau to talk about regulations and to make that connection. And then I've done some other work uh, that is parallel to this project, working on some of the education components, including primary school and college. I haven't gotten much into secondary school stuff yet. And so things that are outstanding are looking at market, market expansion and workforce development. And then this find responses to specific items. I'll use that on the next slide as a means of kind of blowing up what came out of that needs assessment that I went over before. So kind of the top three or four things was dealing with costs and margins. So producers are worried about catastrophic failures, be it on the system level, as in, you know, your fish die versus business level uh, in terms of just not managing your, your operation well. They're worried about growing products successfully. And they're worried about their business structure and expansion opportunities, understanding that most of these producers sell everything they grow. So really it's can they make their operations bigger? How do they do that given the constraints that they have, which in many cases is either spatial, they don't have any more land, or it may be uh, water where they can't, don't have any more wells or pumps and they can't pull more water through their systems, which is pretty relevant as far as how, you're, um, how many fish you can grow. Uh, they were concerned about regulatory stuff. So they worried about being over-regulated and they were looking for an easier, more straightforward permitting process. There is some question out there at different points of which agency is in charge of what, as far as uh, getting the permits in place to set up an operation. And there are marketing questions. Um, one of them called it the whole fish challenge is how do you get people to eat a whole fish as opposed to the filet based um, culinary choices that most people make. And there's the issue of increasing consumer comfort with, a non, with non-traditional farming methods. So your head of lettuce did not come out of the ground. It came out of a, um, an NFT bed, getting people comfortable with that idea and willing to buy the products. And then the other concern they had was forming an aquaculture association, as well as uh, getting some kind of education training programs set up. So those are basically in order of how they came out of the survey. So next issue is expanding aquaculture. Our objective is expanding the aquaculture community in Vermont and the, the basin. Um, so we want to connect producers to existing webinars, short courses, and online resources. I've used the Great Lakes Aquaculture Network to do that. Um, GLAC is, uh, was put together by, uh, actually, it's Aquaculture Consortium, therefore GLAC. Um, so that was put together by what? Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, all grouped together to pull their resources to address the issues and concerns of aquaculture, aquaculturists in those states. I have kind of been an observer on there. I've uh, played observer for their meetings and have been there and um, listening and when information comes down the pipeline about webinars and such, I will package those up and forward them along to the, uh, to the people in the Vermont network. So there was an interest in developing a land-based aquaculture short course. Um, what I'm planning on doing this year while I'm here in, uh, in Burlington is a how-to construction demo for a home-based rack aquaponics system. So I'm going to essentially tape that in you know, YouTube five, 10, 15 minute segment kind of set up and then post those online. And I'm also signed up to deliver an online aquaponics course in the summer term of, term of 2022. 
uh, they wanted to see a new short course and online resources made available. So again, I'll be filming those segments in Vermont to post on the, the website. And part of that is creating an aquaculture website to go to stand up with the um, LC, uh, uh, Lake Champlain Sea Grant uh, main webpage. So next is enhancing the ability of aquaculture businesses to respond to market disruptions and to become more resilient. This has kind of a broad overarching um, action item, which was build connections that we had to spend some time breaking down into what that actually meant. So we define this as facilitating direct connections with aquaculture producers who are seeking specific guidance and assistance. We managed to accomplish this through some through site visits and follow up calls. Um, we've been working on inviting experts to share their knowledge of aquaculture business practices through webinars or other means. Like I said, I've principally done this through GLAC. I haven't brought anyone in specifically through a Vermont network worker connection to um, to do this kind of expert knowledge sharing. And then identifying opportunities and making connections between aquaculture producers. The places where local food is needed. Haven't really worked on this much. I did kind of had an idea based partly on something that happened in the GLAT network where they connected to a food truck and had that food truck use some aquaculture products to per at a festival. So that may be a direction we can go if I can find a, a food truck outfit that's willing to work with um, one of our producers. Again, the interesting thing being though that just about everybody is selling everything they make. So it's like kind of a chicken egg thing. <laughs> All right. Um, and then we're getting down to the end here. So providing introductory workforce development opportunities. So we define this as promoting the growth of aquaculture through an introduction to aquaculture workshop university course and or middle high school teacher training. So I got a uh, kind of an extension grant or a parallel grant with through a second year of federal funding to work with ECHO and to basically stand up a, a middle school aquaponics teaching kit. So this is a physical kit with a set of um, lesson plans in it that ECHO will share with their uh, with the STEM teachers that they work with, and they'll be able to set up a small, really it's a hydroponic system in their classroom. But then uh, the reasoning for that was because they couldn't wrap their head around how to deal with live fish in a classroom. So the, uh, the end point was, okay, well, we're going to do it as a hydroponic system, give them the nutrients, but then use that growing process to talk about different ways to get nutrients in, into a, a plant. So that is moving along nicely. Um, that will be rolled out in June at uh, the ECHO STEM teacher training. And I'll do a introduction to that kit and aquaponics at that event. Uh, like I said, I've got the NR289 advising to build, have students build an aquaponic system. We're gonna look for summer interns or at least one to help care for that system once it's uh, set up, at least for the summer and then see if it goes into the fall or not. And this will be right in the atrium or the maker space uh, area, a little atrium there in, in Aiken. So I've got the summer session online course and I've also signed up to do a 4-H activity that's scheduled for April, which will again be having students make a little mini system that shows them gravity flow and talk about the basis of how most aquaponic or aquaculture systems are set up. All right, so um, what I'm interested in for additional feedback from you guys, is so what meeting topics does the uh, advisory committee wanna see covered in winter and spring 20? 22. Um, is there expertise in the AC for a meeting around market expansion or workforce development or how to expand your business? Um, are those online short course, short courses or system builds enough to meet the expanding community 
objectives. And also what Vermont business incubator associations can provide good targeted advice to aquaculture producers. Um, business to business opportunities, what should we be looking for? And are there other entry area workforce development opportunities to look for as in on-site intern, interns or other hands-on training? I will stop sharing my screen and kick over so I can take notes on one of these two computers. And then, yeah, just invite people to chime in with ideas or criticisms or whatever you'd like to see done or, or not done. That's a bucket of work, Theo. Great stuff, man. Hey, I'm, I was wondering if, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about fish, we've talked a little bit about shrimp, um, and then you mentioned the algae growers. Um, I wonder if we, it'd be worthwhile to do a session at some point over the years about uh, aquatic plants and, you know, where they're headed and, and what potentials. So we don't have any sea, and we only have freshwater in Vermont. Maybe, uh, maybe plants are a good one for Vermont. Okay, yeah. The, um, what was, we actually had somebody who was on staff. He recently left, Mark. Campion and his one of the things that he said was is anyone looking at growing um, wetland plants for planting and restoration he said there's a shortage of those around uh, it's not something I looked very far into I'm not really sure how to chase that but it'd probably be something to go to some of the growing places around and see if where people are getting this getting their plants to begin with yeah Yeah, and I don't know if related to that. I mean, you're you're a kelp grower, so you probably know something about this. But um, there's some research about kelp and the possibility to feed cows. You know, I'm always about the cows around here. Um, so I, I don't know if it's part of that uh, plant conversation. Um, we don't really have uh, ocean, but um, we do have cows, and so I wonder if the kelp cow feed thing would be anything to be, you know, would be interesting for Vermonty kind of things as as a section of that plant conversation. I'm not sure how far that's, I know they're trying it on the coast, but like I said, I don't know where else that's, how far further inland they've gone, but that's the kind, let's see, if you were to, if there were, and I guess that's another thing I don't have much of, so once you get outside of this industry, I don't have good connections in other locations, like I don't know anyone in the, besides um, maybe Shay, that I could go to and say, hmm, I need to, I'm interested in connecting to some dairy farmers or cattle farmers who want to try feeding their cows kelp or kelp pellets or something. So I, I don't have those connections. So if you have them, then yeah, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, Ryan, you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Um, we appreciate uh, you sharing all the work you've done. Um, really a, an impressive body of work over um, the past year. Uh, my, my common, my, my question um, relates to the uh, priorities that are identified in the Climate Action Plan uh, and the potential role that aquaculture systems can play in uh, building food security and resilience within um, the, the food supply in Vermont. Um, most of the work that was undertaken um, in the development of the climate action plan focused on the terrestrial uh, raising of uh, food and crops uh, and didn't really look into um, aquaculture systems either that exist in Vermont or uh, the role they could play um, as, as this market looks to develop. And so a question I have is um, when we look at, you know, uh, protein per um, ton of CO2 produced, what's the efficiency of aquaculture systems, how does it, that integration uh, either support uh, climate resilience on farms from a market standpoint or a diversification standpoint, uh, and um, just other inter intersection with um, some of the adaptation and resilience goals uh, that the state has set. Um, is uh, aquaculture and expanding um, that, that sector, um, is that uh, you know, a, a good policy for the state to pursue? So those are some of my, my questions. I, I suspect that 
um, there's lots of opportunity there, um, but just as the climate action plan will be amended um, in the next four years, um, having um, a section or a commentary on, on the work this group is doing, it might be useful to uh, inform uh, future recommendations that come out of a, a, a future amendment to the climate action plan. Thanks. Cool, thank you. Um, so I haven't looked, let's see, um, to partial answer to your question, I have looked at some stuff around this. Most of it comes out of Europe and it really depends on, it depends on what your energy source is. I mean, growing, um, fish or doing aquaponics can be pretty energy intensive. And if you can get that energy from renewable resources, it really lowers the footprint of the activity. If it's coming out of a coal fire um, uh, power plant, you, it's not helping you so much. So uh, one of the things I'm kind of poking around with now, one of the ideas is I did, so I did a lecture uh, for the, the uh, I guess the fisheries, one of the fisheries classes. And and looking to frame aquaculture, one of the things I noticed is that the first world sucks up a lot of resources. And a lot of those resources are based in developing countries. So we're pulling fish out of their oceans to feed people here. So it comes down to, well, if we can localize our own use, our own footprint, and start eating what we grow, then that um, frees up some of those resources for those people that are there in those developing countries. So, you know, that's a, that's a kind of a theory I'm, I'm batting around. So yeah, it's just, uh, um, can you reduce your large scale footprint by localizing your own use of protein to where you are? Because frankly, if you, someone in sub-Saharan Africa is not going to be saved by a $12 per pound filet of trout or salmon. So, but yeah, we'll have a, um, I'll have a look at the uh, maybe putting together a white paper that might um, inform the climate action group when they go back in to revise that. Thank you. Yeah, just an open invitation. Um, seems like a, a good opportunity. Thanks. Uh, Jane. Hi, um, this is only my second meeting. I've been on sabbatical last semester. Um, and there's a couple of things that I, I just want to say, and this is just for points of information. I think it's Stephanie McKay or Sabrina Greenwood are just part of one of those sustainable agricultural USDA grants that I think went to Colby feeding seaweed to cows. So I just throw that out. I, somebody said something about that two comments ago. Um, I, don't, I don't really know how that translates. Um, the other thing is we have a group and I'm from CDAE um, that we're working with in Puerto Rico who have built these aquaponic systems that you say you're going to build with your students. And I think there's some synergy there. And I, I think Travis Reynolds is supposed to be on this call. He was on call number one. Um, and um, I, I just, I think there might be some synergy there. So that's a second thing that I want to say. And Travis and I have a project on resilience in aquaculture and aquaponics and so on in Puerto Rico. And then the last thing is, I wonder, I really do wonder how clean these systems are and how circular they are. That was something that the Puerto Rican group was um, really trying to work on because we also took a, a group of students to Africa where, you know, tilapia grown in these tubs is supposed to be sustainable and locally developed, but I'm telling you, I wouldn't eat one of the, those fish because they're basically living in poop and not knowing what they eat. I don't know. I'm just kind of throwing these things out. I'm finding this fascinating what you're talking about, um, but I think there's lots more synergies between, between groups. Great. Thanks. Yeah. You, uh, well, when we get the one set up in, uh, in Aiken, you'll have to come visit. And if you want to visit before then, um, Holly has an aquaponics system up in Bakersfield that is, uh, and it's attached to a greenhouse they call the Ark, um, which is a pretty uh, 
cool setup. So yeah, we actually have to go up there and shoot some footage for uh, for the Echo stuff. So yeah, if you want to tag along and see what one looks like stateside. Fascinating. <laughs> Thank you. And actually, I think Lisa put something in the chat about that project. I was just talking about maybe. There it is. UVM, Lisa, you just want to talk? <laughs> Oh, sure. Yeah. The, well, it was before earlier, 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 I think Julian was the one who made the comment about, oh, how about feeding some of this algae to cows? And I knew about the seaweed project, so I had dropped that link in. So then it was perfect that Jane brought it up and mentioned there's a project. So there's some information on it here. Um, and, you know, people at UVM that you can connect with to find out what's going on with seaweed and connecting with aquaculture there and how does that translate? And I don't know the answer. I have no idea how that translates. Just throwing it out there as um, more contacts if you do wanna go down this path. Sure. I think you were the one before who asked the question we were talking about the dairy conversion thing of, have you asked any dairy producers <laughs> if they'd at all be interested in this? And I guess the thing I was looking to follow up with with you is like, who should I contact to get a hold of a dairy producer and ask that question or questions? Well, yeah, I, I remember the context. Um, you were saying we were thinking this is a good thing for um, dairy farms that are having a hard time. And I had said, boy, it's really, you know, could, maybe, but you know, some dairy farmers really like milking cows and this is pretty different. So it'd be interesting to have those conversations. Um, I think a good place to start would be with the farm viability programs. UVM has a farm viability program. I don't know if you've met Mark Canella. Actually, he, he's on sabbatical in Puerto Rico right now, come to think of it. Um, small world, lots of UVM projects in Puerto Rico, but there, there's other people on his team who it, are It's here. negative seven tomorrow. I wonder why. <laughs> so if you're looking at it for an excuse to go to Puerto Rico, a lot of people at UVM seem to have found those in the winter. At, at any rate, um, I think speaking to the UVM farm viability and, and other you know farm viability people, the folks who are talking with farmers, especially dairy farmers who may be having a difficult situation would be good to check in with. I, I'll be interested to hear what Ryan has to say, but certainly the agency of ag is in touch with a lot of dairy farmers. I mean, I work with dairy farmers that are open to the visitor, open to visitors and you know, I'll certainly keep my, my ears open if I come across anyone um, who is interested in agri aquaculture, but you know, you could put the word out in the Vermont dairy industry that this is an opportunity for anyone who's interested. As I, I'll, I'll just one more follow on, which is as you and I have discussed in the past, Theo, the piece that I'm especially focused on is the that educational outreach, the you know the agritourism. If you you know if this is going to be open to visitors in some way, and it it feels like you and the um, aquaculture producers that we have now are not quite there. Um, yet, but you know when that comes up, and and I think we're oh yeah, and where Sarah Danley's working in the um, Upper Valley, you know that that may well be a model project. Also Nordic Farms, I know you're in touch with them. You know these all may be as these um, aquaculture operations get up and running. I think there will be a public that's very interested in learning more, and I, that's especially where I'd like to get involved and work more closely. Yeah. There's a, it's, it's kind of a, in many cases, it's a scale problem with, with uh, the setups. They're not very big, so there isn't a huge tour component, or they're located literally on someone's property in their yard. Sure. So um, Matt Danaher has plenty of space to actually do this kind of, um, to do that kind of tour but it's literally like it, it's everybody walking underneath his bedroom window as they're doing it so it's it's they're very um like 
classic farming thing. They're on people's property. They're in their yards. It's really kind of a um, labor of love at the home sort of thing. So I haven't really heard anyone say, yeah, I don't want to do tours, except for maybe uh, uh, John with Nordic. Uh, but they're not set up yet. They're still, you know, 12 to 18 months away from having enough of a finished infrastructure to actually be able to bring people in and make a meaningful tour out of what they're doing. But I still love having your your presence. <laughs> Well, I'll keep showing up. And, you know, the nice thing about these new operations um, coming online is some of them, like Nordic Farms, as they develop, they're developing with the idea of education and outreach and having visitors so they can design their facility in a way that is suitable for visitors. And maybe that's, you know, maybe that's where we find the connection. And that also ties into something you had on your list of questions earlier was, was the markets. And I know you've been in touch with Tara Pereira from Vermont Fresh Network, but I think you know, continuing to explore those restaurant connections and those um, direct markets is, is something else that I think will be really interesting moving forward. Hey, right. thank you. And I think Ryan was first. Sure, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on, on opportunities for communicating a survey. Um, if you're interested, um, the Agency of Agriculture monthly, um, our AgReview newspaper is distributed to every uh, dairy farm in the state. And so if you wish to draft a you know, summary article and include a link to a survey or just solicit people to get in uh, touch with you directly, whichever you prefer, um, we'd be happy to run that. Um, we need about a month and a half lead time to try to integrate something like that. Um, so if you have uh, maybe even a, a, a two month advance notice of when you'd want to run that, if you'd like to run that, um, we can work to hold space um, in that pro for um, uh, an, an article of that type. Cool. And does that like have pictures in it or just uh... I'll send the link. Um, it all depends on space. Um, often can include photographs, et cetera, charts, what have you. Um, just depends on, I think, what your goals are and how much lead time we have to plan the layout uh, for that month's publication. All right. Great. Thanks. Breck. Uh, hey folks, how you doing? Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of, of Lake Champlain uh, Sea Grant Institute. And, and lest I forget to, to say so, I just want to take a second to, to say how much I appreciate the work that Theo is, is doing in, in this space and how much I appreciate your efforts to ad advise him and to advise us on this. Uh, I, I just continue to think that there is some potential in, in this for uh, important growth. And I, I, I really appreciate the way that, that Ryan articulated this a, a few minutes ago about, um, I've always thought of this as some sort of a parallel to our farm to table uh, efforts in, in Vermont. And it's kind of the aquatic uh, com, uh, component of that or complement to that. Um, and, and Lisa, I'm, I just have a, I'm curious, uh, how, how important are not, not necessarily farm tours, but farm stay uh, opportunities in, in Vermont? Is that, is that an important component of our tourism sector? It's certainly very important for the farms that provide those, the lodging opportunities. I mean, if you looked at it as like, what percentage of lodging takes place on farms? Compared to you know the sure. larger hotels, it's a small percent. But in terms of contributing for farm viability and diversifying income and educating visitors, it's very important. So I'm just kind of wondering what motivates somebody to to do a farm stay, and I, I, I got to think that at least a part of it is to see the big animals and and you know the. Uh, but that another part of it is might be uh, kind of seeing the integration of what's going on 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 the farm, and um, I don't imagine uh, 
aquaculture kind of replacing dairy. That that, that that's hard for me to wrap my head ar around that. But for it to be integrated with dairy, uh, and and so for you know methane generators that produce the the power to power now an aquaculture uh, facility on on the farm, and that being something that attracts people to come see it. Um, seems like a, a uh, an, an interesting package. Is that is that a pipe dream? Oh, I mean that's true. A lot of visitors, especially to Vermont, um, are very interested in sustainability, regeneration. They want to understand where their food comes from, where their fuel comes from, and so a lot of them are coming here for these immersive educational experiences. I, I just think that would be a, a, a nice selling point, you know, for for a synergy between dairy and aquaculture. So dairy is providing the energy to power aquaculture, and both are producing food. Yep, I it it's very, we get a lot of visitors to Vermont who are really looking. They're not just here to ski. Some are, but you know, often even even the skiers um, come with a variety of different motivations and are very interested in under understanding the working landscape and seeing it up close and personally, and you know, really getting to experience and taste and touch and smell um, all, all all the good things about being on a farm. Thanks. I gotta admit, I didn't know there was such a thing as farm stay. I mean, I suppose it's like Airbnb on a farm, but never even occurred to me. Oh yeah, overnight farm stays. A, a lot of people love staying on farms and um, there's an organization called Farm Stay USA. And not just in the US, I mean, this is a global phenomenon. Yeah. Where people wanna go to Italy or India or wherever. Um, and stay on a farm, you know, get out of the city, stay on a farm and learn about where their food comes from and also fuel and fiber. Yeah, it, what a, the, some of the things are locked in, like the, uh, the, some of the education stuff is either funded or already moving or on the books. So some of the bigger holes are, particularly the business connection stuff, which is a little harder for me to figure out because I don't know who to, like who those organizations are in Vermont. I know they exist, um, but yeah, like there's, what do I look at? There's like a Vermont Business Incubator Association or something like that. So it's like, are they good people to go to? They, they actually know something. And there's the issue of who wants the, um, who actually wants the help because, some of these guys are not interested in growing. They're pretty happy with the size they are. Some are interested and some are just not sure because as far as they're concerned, from what they can see, they're kind of hemmed in. So it's kind of one of those things of throwing the information out there and seeing who comes back with, hey, I'd like to talk with this person um, more one-on-one -on -one and see what they can do for me. I'd just like to for the benefit of the advisory committee, just, just to mention that one of my motivations for, for wanting to, to promote us, the Sea Grant, uh, getting Lake Champlain Sea Grant Institute, getting involved in this area. Um, and the reason we've, we've you know, wanted to bring Theo on and, and uh, help us out in, in thinking about this is that the National Sea Grant Program, as you may know, has been investing pretty heavily in, in the area of aquaculture over many years, but especially over the last four or five years. And it seems that that's going to continue for a while. Um, and so I, I, I think that there's an opportunity for some level of funding that, that we could carve out of um, these, these uh, national uh, initiatives. And so um, you know, some strategic thinking about where we might, um, uh, you know, what, what sort of projects or project we, we might propose that would allow us to tap into some of that funding would, would be um, something I'd, I would look, I, I would be excited about us pursuing. And the Sea Grant program can, can 
can support the process. You know, we can help with the process. Uh, you know, submit the proposal, manage the funds, do do whatever. It's a matter of generating the ideas. You know, and and uh, putting them out there. Yeah, I found that you need a couple of things to have a successful proposal. Um, one of the biggest things is people who are really interested in participating once it's funded. So I've definitely had proposals that were written, got funded, and then people who were on the other end were like, eh, we're kind of lukewarm to this. And that usually creates a problem <laughs> right there. So making sure that we have buy-in from the community and that they're game to and agree with the objectives of that proposal or that's a pretty big um, need before you put these in. So the the Aquaculture Association, once it's formed, they want to do a marketing study. Uh, we've figured out where to go, that there is a USDA um, value-added producer grant that's out there. So okay. moving through those steps, but it's the association that has to put that proposal in. And I'm happy to help write it, but ultimately they're the ones who have to sign off and be responsible for the the funding when it um, comes in, which they didn't pass on to somebody else, but that's kind of the, the link that's got to happen. So um, that is the biggest like next step kind of grant opportunity that would uh, advance the industry that I've seen. And we're kind of waiting on that association component to come together to got push it, it forward. Okay. okay, good. Thanks for you. Yeah, go ahead, Lisa. So I, I put a couple links into chat um, just because earlier you were talking about sort of support for farms, business planning for farms. And so I just put in, um, you know, a link for not specific to farms, small business development um, corporation. And then specific for farms is the farm viability program that I mentioned that UVM and, and NOFA and Intervale and there are a number of organizations that work together on it. But I wanted to mention with the, if, if you're talking about the value added, the USDA um, value added producer grant, that can be submitted by a business. I don't know that it has, at, at least I've worked with um, producers in the past that have submitted um, an application. Now, maybe if it's specifically for the association, maybe it has to be put in by the association, but I guess and I, I'm not sure what the current deadline is for, um, for the VAPG um, opportunity, but um, you know, it's, it's something else that specific businesses can put in for. We can't at UVM put in for it, but a business could. Yeah, it's soon. It's like February, sometime in February. But yeah, um, and there are folks at VHCB um, who have a lot of experience supporting producers applying for these. Um, value added producer grants. Like, I don't know if you've met Rose Wilson or, you know, kind of any of the, the farm marketing consultants. So, the way the VAPG value added producer grant works um, for, for a producer, it's a tricky thing to write. You know, it's a USDA grant, and there's um, the, the scoring can be a little hard to understand. So, you know, I'd recommend reaching out to, and I can help make a connection if it would be helpful um, to folks at VHCB who have experience with applying to the value added producer grants, or, or maybe, sorry if I'm, you know, trying to provide contacts and information you may already have, but, you know, there are people who've at least worked with it in the non aquaculture arena, if that would be helpful. No, that'd be great. That'd be actually be a great connection to kind of push that along. Um... I think we did, so between John and I, who is, and John's role in this grant is he's sort of, he's a collaborator and he's sort of paid from it and he's also private and he's also a producer. So it gets kind of muddled, but uh, so he, I've kind of used him as my um, primary connection into the industry as far as what's going on and who's um, doing what and who to call. So when we talked about it, we kind of, we came up with, this need for a marketing study, and then identified that grant as an opportunity. I've called the grant coordinator. I've had that conversation. So right now it's figuring out who's actually going to be the lead. His idea was to use the association as the lead since it's supposed to be a project that would benefit the entire community. Um, 
It's just a question of whether the association will be set up in time to actually do that. So yeah. kind of thing we do need to start moving on. I may be thinking of a different opportunity. I just I just put in the link for the value added producer grant and it doesn't look like it's currently open. Um, but you know, there's a new head um, for USDA rural development, a new Vermont, um, New York, Vermont, um, New Hampshire head, um, Sarah Waring, who's great, um, who I think could help. It might be useful to connect with her and she can help you understand um, what opportunities are available. Because there's also the US, what is it? US um, Rural Business Development Grants. And so the Rural Business Development Grants, I think some of them are for producer associations. All right, I'll look into that. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, I think this is the one you're talking about. This is due February 28th and it's the Rural Business Development Grant. Yeah, it was, uh, either way, the conversation I had was about, it'll be announced at roughly at this date, between this date and this date, and it's usually due between this date and this date. It's like, okay. Yes, so. the Rural Business Development Grants are open um, and they are due February 28th. And the Rural Business Development Office, um, which now Sarah Waring is the new head, uh, but you know they've got staff people who have been there a while, they are fabulous to work with. And it makes sense to, you know, kind of have some one-on-one -on -one conversations about what you're planning to, to apply for and what your needs are, and they'll help steer you in the right direction. And, and maybe um, John's already done this. I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> He's a little busy. <laughs> Definitely worth a couple of um, phone calls over there. All right, will do. I'll, I'll find their contact info and put it in. You know, they've got some kind of longtime grant staff people. And now Sarah Waring has just been appointed as the new head of that, um, of, of, you know, of the Vermont New Hampshire office. 